So we're coming to the end of our Sermon on the Mount series. It's been nearly 18 months we've been going through this series. Next week's going to be our last message. Thank you, you said R. <laughs> well done, thank you. Next week will be our last message. But today we come to what I believe is the most terrifying verses you could possibly read in Scripture. I know I haven't sold it well, but we're going to read it together now. I think we should stand. It's God's Word. Let's stand. We're going to read Matthew 7. Matthew 7, verse 21. These are our Lord's words, not mine, they're Jesus' words. The words that uh, spoke time, space and matter into existence and now sang this to us this morning. It says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name drive out demons and in your name perform many miracles? Then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. Away from me, you evildoers. Thank you. Please be seated. That last verse, verse 23, away from me, I never knew you. That's terrifying, isn't it? These are words that I pray none of us here today will ever hear from the mouth of our Lord. So we're going to break it down, see what it says, see what it means. Verse 21, Jesus, he begins this section essentially by reaffirming last week's message, last week's section, uh, regarding false prophets. But what he is doing here is calling us, his followers, into action. He's warning us against over-spiritualising the faith, against using Christianity as a self-indulgence to make ourselves feel better with God. Or, worst of all, being hypocrites and uh, believing in the spiritual truths but not acting them out in our daily lives, not expressing our faith in works. He's reminding us that it is one thing to believe in Jesus, it's one thing to uh, to believe in Jesus' teaching, But it's quite another thing to go then and live it out and and put it into practice. You remember, the devil believes in Jesus. Verse 21 says, um, Jesus says, Only those who do my Father's will will enter into the kingdom of heaven. The Christian faith is is about doing. We're saved by faith. But we're saved to do. Pray for workers, for the harvest is plentiful. Go, I am sending you as sheep amongst wolves. And this, of course, last week was a very strong challenge to us all. We are not to be false prophets. We are meant to, to live out our faith that God has so graciously called us into. But then Jesus seems to contradict himself here in verse 22. He states that many who does his Father's will, many who put into practice the teaching of the Sermon on the Mount, many who perform the great wonders of the Christian faith in his name, will cry out, Lord, Lord, and yet will be dismissed from God's kingdom. There's a seeming contradiction here between verse 21 and 22, isn't there? So what's going on here? Our Lord can't contradict himself, he's truth. 
Well, to understand this most sobering of uh, verses, we need to go back to the start and do a re- big recap of the Sermon on the Mount. So are you ready for this? Theo, you ready? Turn with me to Matthew 4.23. What we find here, those who have good memories from well over a year ago, we find Jesus in the synagogues and he's proclaiming the good news. The good news of God's kingdom as he is healing people of all sorts of ailments. And as a result, what we see then is large crowds gather around Jesus. They're gathering to see what he can do for them, essentially. But Jesus doesn't preach to these people. Instead, verse five, uh, first one of chapter 5, Jesus leaves all these people, he leaves the crowds, and he walks up a mountain. Why? Well, he, he does this knowing that those who want to be in a relationship with him, those who want to know Jesus and, and get real with Jesus and follow him, will do so. So he walks up this mountain in an act that, to draw the people that are serious from this crowd. Christians. And then, and only then, does he begin to teach them. For he knows that these people, they are willing to leave their old lives behind and follow him by faith. Does that make sense? And he starts with relationship. Firstly, our new relationship with ourselves as new creations in Christ Jesus. He says in chapter 5, verses 3 to 12, Blessed are they who know their own spiritual poverty. Blessed are they who grieve their sin. Blessed are they who control their anger and pride. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Jesus then looks at our relationship with the world as followers of Jesus. And verse 13 of chapter 5, we are commanded to go out and be salt and light. What Jesus is saying here is that we are to individually and corporately, just like salt in a shaker, go out and love the world and fight against the decay of the world and the darkness of the world. Does that make sense? And then in verse 17, Jesus speaks about our relationship with God's law. As his followers, uh, as Christians, God's law is not something to be attained. Because we've all failed already, haven't we? But in Christ, we have the freedom to rise above the law. And Jesus gives us then seven examples of how to do this, that cover all aspects of our life as we live it out in community which is the church. He looks at love, hate, marriage, truth, justice and charity. And that takes us to chapter 6, verse 5, where Jesus then goes even deeper and speaks to our most intimate and and secret and, and hidden living and personal relationships with God. He talks about our prayer life in verses 5 to 14. You know, we can come to God as Father. How intimate is that? It's beautiful, isn't it? He looks at fasting and our our daily living in the presence of God, knowing God is always there, God is always in us. And he's reminding us of that, that God is always with us. He is ever-present. And uh, we can trust him in everything that we do. He teaches us here that God will always provide, that God will always love, that he will give us joy even in the toughest of times, that he will give us comfort 
in the greatest of trials. And some of us have known that this week, haven't we? Because as Christians, as followers of Jesus, we are in a relationship with God. That's what Jesus is teaching us here. We're not just in a relationship, we are married to God in a covenant of his blood. That's a strong bond, isn't it? It's an unbreakable bond. Hallelujah. And this is essentially what the entire Sermon on the Mount is all about. It is about our relationship with God, first and foremost, and how that relationship should be expressed in community as a church and then out to the world. And that's what we spent 18 months looking at. That's the, that's the one-sentence summary. And it is with this understanding of our relationship with Jesus that we should come to these most terrifying words of his. Verse 23. I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. Away from me, you evildoers. You see, what Jesus is doing here is, is he is closing his sermon with a strong challenge. We had part one last week, didn't we? This week, the challenge is for us to go and examine ourselves. We are to go and examine ourselves. We are to examine ourselves in what? Our relationship to who? God. Jesus fears that many of us will take the Sermon on the Mount on board and we will value the instruction that it gives us to a point where we value that instruction over our relationship with God. He's concerned that we would value our service or our church or our religion over our relationship with Jesus. Does that make sense? Jesus is reminding us today that we are to live out this sermon in obedience to God, but we cannot let such expressions of our faith, such works, overshadow our relationship with God. You with me on this? It's very important. So you see, as a church, as, as Christians... We are saved to do, but we must not fall into the trap of being so busy for God that we forget about God. Because then it becomes religion. It becomes about what I've done, not what he's done. We are here to follow Jesus first and foremost. Because it is Jesus, only Jesus, who can set us free. We are not to get distracted by doing good deeds to a point where we lose sight of him. Because if we do, we will hear these terrifying words, I never knew you. Friends, we must never forget that as a church, Nodfa, our primary purpose is to follow and worship Jesus. Our primary purpose is to glorify God in our relationship with him. And then allow our service Monday to Saturday, our service to each other and to the world, to come out from this divine bond. Because then it's powered by divine love. That's a beautiful thing, isn't it? 
as Jesus closes his Sermon on the Mount, he is calling each one of us, his followers, he's calling us today to examine ourselves. Jesus is saying to each one of us this morning, brother, sister, I want you. I want you. I want to be in an intimate relationship with you. That should blow our minds. The creator God of the universe wants to intimately know you. He is saying to us today by these words, I want to be there for you. I want to come to you in your darkness. I want to be there in your despair and fear and anxiety. And I want to come to you and I want to set you free from it all. I want to love you like no other person can. So the question is, do you want me? Do you want me? And this is what he's saying here in verse 23. Then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. Away from me, you evildoers. Friends, these are damning words, aren't they? They're damning words, uh, but they're words not from some cold, heartless judge. That's how we read them at first, don't we? These are words said through the blood and the tears of our Lord and Saviour. These are words from Jesus Christ who gave all of himself on the cross so that he might have a relationship with you. Read it with me again, verse 23. Then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. Away from me, you evildoers. Don't you think the thought of Jesus even saying these words to the people that he loves, they must have been just as painful for him to say as they are for us to hear. They must have been. Knowing what was before him at Calvary. These words would have broken our Lord's heart to say, wouldn't they? But Jesus said them. And that's important for us to remember. Jesus said them. And he said them in love. Why? So that today we can examine ourselves. So that today we can check whether our relationship with God is in the right place. He is saying these words to us so he doesn't have to say this to us on the day of judgment. He's saying them to us now so that we can get our lives in order and put God first Monday to Saturday as well as Sunday. Sunday is the pinnacle of our relationship with God through the week. It's date night or date morning. He said this, these words in love so that today we can examine our relationship with him and get our lives in order. Why? Well, because he wants to know us. Isn't that amazing? Isn't that good news? God wants to know me, despite my sin and failures. That's love, isn't it? Jesus is asking us here to examine ourselves so that we can prioritise Jesus in everything we do. And when we're right with him, all of our relationships with the world become right. Jesus wants to know us. And isn't that the best thing that we could possibly hear? Isn't that the best thing to know? What a privilege it is to be a Christian this morning. To know that God wants to know us and he has done everything that is needed for us to know him. He has made a way.
through Jesus Christ for anyone to come freely and have this intimacy with God. Friends, examine yourselves, examine your relationship with God so you may never hear these most damning words. I want to see you in heaven. Amen. We're going to sing, Knowing You, Jesus. Corinthians 11, very famous verses in regarding the table. Uh, Verse 23, for I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. 
The theme for today is relationship, our relationship with God. Now, our relationship with God is very different to any relationship we have with a human being. Because in a relationship with a human being, it's two-way, isn't it? You know, my wife expects me to do certain things, and I expect her to do certain things, and if we keep on doing those things, we'll be happy. Um, the joy of a Christian marriage is even when the other stops, and it's more likely me, uh, we forgive and grow. But it's a two-way thing, isn't it? We both desire to keep each other happy. The wonderful truth of the gospel, the wonderful truth of this new covenant that we're in, is that Christ has done everything. He has done absolutely everything that we needed to be in a relationship with God. And isn't that good news? Now, Jesus is the only way to God which people sniff their nose up to. They say, well, isn't that a bit exclusive? But it's the most inclusive message you could possibly preach. Because he's done everything, it doesn't matter where you were born, how you were raised, doesn't matter about how much you earn, or how many times you've been to church. Doesn't matter about your religion, your culture, none of that. All humanity is equal before God, and we can equally come to God only through Jesus Christ, because he has done enough for every human being to come. So to the table, he gave us this meal because he knew that we were weak and sinful people. He knew that we would so easily forget the truths of who he is and what he has done for us. So he gave us something tangible to remember. As real as that bread is bread, is as real as he took on flesh and gave it for us. As real as this wine is wine, is as real as his blood being shed for us to wash away all of our sin. So as far as the east is from the west, God sees our sins no more. Now he gives us this meal, date night, for us to come and have relationship with him. He says, I've paid the bill. It's all, done. all you need to do is come. Come and re-promise your commitment in this covenant that I have, I have fulfilled for you. If you're coming because you're patting yourself on the back because you're in church, then you're relying on yourself. If you're coming to this table because you help out in the church's ministries during the week, then you're relying on yourself. Don't take the meal, you're drinking judgment upon yourself. If you are coming because you know you have failed God and that you're not worthy, then take this meal. Because this is for sinners like me who need a saviour. And we'll ask our brother Peter to pray and give thanks for the bread and the wine. Our gracious, loving Heavenly Father, we thank you for this simple meal. We thank you, Lord, that you do not look for works, for ceremony, <coughs> self-righteousness. You look for sinners like us. You want us to know everything <coughs> about this life what it has to offer in its fullness. You want us to have true joy, true companionship, true friendship, true love, true trust, <coughs> true reliance, true rejoicing for all eternity. You want us to have everything you can give us. And it's everything we don't deserve. Of ourselves, we can never attain it. But because of what Jesus did on our cross, he can know it in all its glory. He loved us so much. From the day he was born on this earth, his eyes were set on that cross. Mm -hmm. And he died there for me. 
he died there for all who would believe in him. But he didn't just die there, he rose again. A risen, glorious, great Saviour. Even now interceding for us in the heavens. Hmm. And Lord, we look to him today. If we partake of this meal, we're not saying we're doing it because we feel obliged to do it. Because others might say something if we don't in front of them. We're doing it because we say we love you. Hmm. Because you've forgiven us our sin through your shed blood on our cross. Hmm. Lord, help us to believe. Help us to trust. Help us to love. And so take of this meal. Amen. Amen. I can't stress how serious this is. And it is serious. It's got eternal consequences. When I'm low, when I'm remembering my past, and unfortunately a lot of my present, present, when I feel captive to sin, I pray. I pray, come Emmanuel, release me from this captivity. This is what this table represents, a release of freedom from ourselves, a trust in another, all powerful, all able to free us. Before we partake, I would like us to, to seek the Lord reverently, in fear, but also in love as uh, Lisa and James play for us. Hear the words, hear what they mean. We are captives and he's going to free us. And then those are willing to accept Jesus as their Lord and Saviour, please renew your covenant with him this morning.
Our Lord said, this is my body, which has been broken for you. We will eat as we are served, reminding ourselves that we are saved through our personal relationship with our Lord and Saviour.